Drago Malfoy and the Depths of the Mind by Drago. We'll hear about this. Chapter 15, The Use of Logic in Times of Great Pressure. The following weeks, Hogwarts sank into further chaos. Fred and George's spectacular departure inspired a great deal of other students to make Umbridge's life as difficult as possible, led by their unlikely new figurehead, Beeves the Baltergeist, showering their infamous headmistress in practical pranks of some sorts or other that constantly chased her from to every corner of the castle every minute of every day. The other teachers did as little as they could to help her, and it was a pleasure to watch Umbridge slowly lose her mind, helplessly directing Filch all around the place, who was as powerless against the doom around them as a flabberworm in a firestorm. As the end of the school year grew closer, though, their tension grew, and they spent most of their time in the library revising for their owl exams. Despite their best efforts, Draco and Harry found no time in their laden days to get together and practice occlumency, especially since the final match of the season was scheduled for the last weekend before their exams, too, meaning that whenever Harry wasn't studying, he was on the pitch, training with the team or in a private session with Weasley. And as much as Draco wanted to, he couldn't even be angry! Their latest sessions had been an utter disaster, to the point where Draco wondered if Harry was ever going to get the hang of this particular kind of magic. He had been doing fine up until December, he thought, but something about these lessons with Snape had driven a thorn into the whole process, and now they seemed to be moving backwards, if at all. It was utterly frustrating and made him curse both Snape for being an incompetent teacher and Dumbledore for giving the job to him in the first place. All things considered, the match was a welcome distraction, even if he had to watch Harry go up against Chang, of all people. He tried not to overthink the fact that Quidditch was most definitely what had caught Harry's attention about the girl in the first place, and that this might be an opportunity for them to reconcile. Hermione would have his head if he voiced any of those fears out loud, and instead focused on the thrill of the game. Slytherin was pretty much out of the race for the cup this year, so he could just sit back and enjoy without worrying about the comments from his teammates. Or at least that had been the plan. But the match had barely started when Hagrid suddenly appeared behind Hermione and Draco and swiftly abducted them from the stands and into the Forbidden Forest. And Draco would have protested because it was the Sadic Forest and getting into trouble right under Umbridge's nose couldn't be a good idea. But Hagrid's face was bruised and bloody and anxious, and he knew that this was their one shot at finding out what Hagrid had been hiding from them all these months. And damn him if he was going to miss it! So they followed Hagrid into the thickening trees without complaint, Drago doing his best to not voice any of his worries when they stepped off the path and shushing Hermione when she asked too many questions about why Hagrid was carrying a crossbow. He quieted his growing anxiety as they followed their friend deeper and deeper into the forest until it was almost too dark to see where they were going, and Hermione timidly asked if they could cast a Lumos. Only then did Hagrid stop to fill them in. Right, well, see, the thing is, he took a deep breath, well, there's a good chance I'm going to be getting to sack any day now. Draco grimaced, averting his eyes. But you've lasted this long, Hermione tried to console him, but the attempt was weak. What makes you think? Umbridge records it was me to put the Niffler in her office. Hagrid interrupted him. Draco cursed. That had been one of the many pranks throughout the last couple of weeks. The Niffler had taken Umbridge's whole office apart in its hunt for shiny objects. You know she's been looking for a chance to get rid of me ever since I got back. I don't want to go, of course. But if it wasn't for... Well... The special circumstances I'm about to explain to you, I leave right now, before she's got the chance to do it in front of the whole school, like she did with Trelawney. Hermione made to protest next to him, but Draco just stared at him, resigned to their fate. Hagrid held up his hands to quieten Hermione. It's not the end of the world, Hermione. I'll be able to help Dumbledore once I'm out of here. I can be useful to the Order. And you little have grubbly blank, you'll, you'll get through your exams fine. His voice wobbled a little at that point, and it broke Draco's heart. Don't worry about me, he added hastily when he saw their faces. He pulled out an enormous handkerchief and dabbed his eyes with it. Look, I wouldn't be telling you this at all if I didn't have to. See you for go. Well, I can't leave without without telling someone, because I'll, I'll need you to, to hurt me and Harry and Ron if they're willing. Help you with what? 
Draco asked, alert now. What do you need to tell us about Hagrid? Just spit it out already! Your sheep. Hagrid began, still teary-eyed, shifting where he stood. When I came back from me mission in November, I did not exactly come alone. He let the words hang in the air. Draco turned to stare at Hermione, eyes wide. Hermione's gaze, though, was fixed on Hagrid. She looked horrified. But Hagrid, she protested, you told us none of them wanted to come. Well, no, he didn't want to come, Hagrid admitted. But I had to bring him, Hermione. I had to. May I ask why? Draco cut in, his voice slightly higher than usual. I know you tend to form special attachments where others don't, but please explain why you thought this was a good idea. Just for me. They were all bullying him. Hagrid told him his dark button-like eyes, bright and glassy. Because he's so small. I couldn't leave him. Small! Draco repeated his voice faint. Of course. But, Hermione began sounding despaired. I really don't want to sound heartless, Hagrid, but if he didn't want to come... Where's my brother, Hermione? Hagrid interrupted her, immediately rendering them silent. Well, off, brother. And really, what could they say to any of that? Bless Hermione. She tried. She threw a fuss and tried to be the voice of logic, but Draco knew from that moment on that it would be no use. Because Hagrid was stubborn when it came to random creatures he'd picked up in the Forbidden Forest, or one-off strangers in a pub. But this was his flesh and blood. There was no way he was going to back down on this, and Draco wasn't going to try. If Hagrid thought he had any chance to teach his giant brother English and instruct him on how to behave like a socially acceptable member of the Wizarding Society, there was nothing they could say to change his mind. So he resigned himself to his fate of keeping a great secret and doing whatever he asked of him, even if it was meeting a wild giant in the Forbidden Forest in case Hagrid got sacked. Hermione, though, had other opinions. You can't honestly think about doing what he asks, Draco! She hissed as they left Hagrid on the way out of the forest, so furious that her bushy mane seemed to have developed a life of her own and appeared to be threatening him in its agitation. It's both absolutely insane, ridiculously dangerous, and completely pointless. There is no way Grot will care if we go meet him one way or another. You know it and I know it. He will beat us into a bloody puddle should he get the chance, and that is if we even get to him in the first place. Don't forget that the centaurs are on the warpath. If we enter the forest without Hagrid... It's his brother, Hermione. Draco sighed. We can't just do nothing. You're supposed to be my reasonable friend, she accused, sounding scandalized. While that might be true, Drago sighed, I'm also a pure blood. You might have forgotten with the way I turned against my own father, but I was raised to treasure family bonds. Hermione looked the pain in his words. I did not try to stop Miss Harry from talking to Sirius because I knew how much he needs what he views as his only remaining family once every now and then. Drago continued, And just the same, I won't ask Hagrid to abandon his brother. Even if he happens to be a giant. And frankly, as the leader of an elf liberation group, I didn't think you would. Hermione flushed at that. I'm not asking him to abandon him, she muttered. I'm just asking him not to put us in danger over it. He doesn't really have a choice, does he? Draco countered. Should he get sacked? There was a long silence between them, and it allowed them to register the cheers from the Quidditch pitch. Is the match over? Draco asked, distracted. Seems like it, Hermione muttered. Should we go find Ron and Harry? Tell them about what Hagrid just showed us. Only if Gryffindor lost, Draco frowned. If they won, let's not bother them with it just yet. Let them enjoy their victory. It turned out that Gryffindor had indeed won both the match and the House Cup in their absence. Cheering crowds of Gryffindor students were making their way up to the castle, no doubt intending to continue the celebration up at their common room. Hermione and Draco exchanged a quiet glance. Tomorrow, then, Draco muttered, squeezing her shoulder. Yes, she sighed, making her way up to the Gryffindor Tower herself, no doubt to find their victorious friends. I'll see you tomorrow. See you, Draco smiled. Tell Harry congrats from me. I will. She smiled back before they parted ways, leaving Draco to walk down to the dungeons in solitude. From what Draco could gather, it had been quite a match for Weasley, which made the news that Draco and Hermione had been absent through most of his legendary success, all the more crushing to him. Consequently, he did not take to their news about Hagrid well. 
Well, you're going to have to break your promise. He shrugged, immediately siding with Hermione before beginning to count off all of Hagrid's dangerous escapades on his fingers, from Fluffy to Aragog, leaving Draco to roll his eyes and turn to Harry expectantly. We can't just abandon Hagrid when he needs us, he muttered, gray eyes boring into green ones. He's been there for us all these years, and you know there's nothing he wouldn't do for us. Harry heaved a deep sigh and nodded. You're right, he said. Harry! Hermione hissed. You don't need to do anything. You don't want to. Harry shrugged. If you don't want anything to do with it, Draco and I can handle it. Great, Weasley muttered. The day with the greatest risk of being chucked out of the school. Hermione pursed her lips, but when she met Draco's eyes, she flushed in embarrassment and averted her gaze. Draco imagined she knew that there was nothing she could say to change his mind, even if that didn't stop her from fretting. With the beginning of June, it was like a switch had been turned on the whole school. The whole fifth year was collectively losing their heads over their owls, to a point where Draco voluntarily chose the seat next to Luna Lovegood throughout one of his Gryffindor friend's absences in the library to prevent hearing more of everyone's nonsense. Students had even started a black market for illegal substances like fake brain stimulants, forcing Draco and Hermione in extra shifts of their prefect duties. Well, Weasley too, but he arguably just didn't care as much about the cause as they did. When exams began on the second Monday of the month, it was the first time that Draco's nerves were actually stretched thin by something as simple as an examination. He knew that he did not lack in knowledge and expertise, but it was the examiners that gave him a headache. They were employed by the ministry, after all. What if they, like Umbridge, were less than neutral? Their theoretical exams were set for the mornings and the practical ones for the afternoons. They started out with charms on Monday, followed by transfiguration on Tuesday, herbology on Wednesday, DADA on Thursday, and ancient runes on Friday, or in Harry and Weasley's case, a day off. The first week blew by relatively unspectacularly, though Draco was so tired on Friday night that he fell asleep over potions provisions, only to have Harry poke him awake in time for Garfield. The second week was no better. Monday started off with potions, Tuesday with care of magical creatures, and Wednesday was divided between arithmancy, or else divination, and astronomy in the evening. And here was when it stopped being generic, frantic exam writing. Because throughout their examination, Umbridge, in all seriousness, walked up to Hagrid's hut with over escort to sack him, resulting in the whole of the fifth year witnessing the scuffle between Hagrid and the Ministry officials. Professor McGonagall, who had rushed across the grounds to intervene, had been hit by no less than four stunning spells and gone down, and Hagrid, seemingly immune to the stunners, had fled the scene. Needless to say, none of them got much work done for the remaining minutes of the examination. Their last exam, History of Magic, was set for the next morning. Draco had barely managed to sleep the night before, images of auras attacking Hagrid, haunting him through the darkness, but he did his best to focus on the parchment before him, penning down the information he had crammed up in his head as if in a trance. His little bubble burst quite dramatically, though, when a scream burst through the great hall, making the blood freeze in Draco's veins as he whirled around to stare over his shoulder. The noise came from Harry, who had fallen off his chair, one hand clutching his forehead. His skin was pale and sweaty, and Draco was on his feet before he knew it about to storm towards him, but he was stopped by one of the examiners, whose surprisingly strong grip caught on his elbow and held him in place. He tried to shake Professor Marchbanks off, who was an old, seemingly fragile woman, but she did not budge, and in the meantime, Professor Tofty had clambered to Harry's side and was accompanying his friend out into the entrance hall. This is an examination, Mr. Malfoy, Professor Marchbanks told him sternly. Please return to your paper. Professor Tofty has everything under control. The doors closed behind Harry and the examiner, and Draco had no choice but to nod numbly and return to his seat. He did not write a word for the remaining twelve minutes of the exam. When he was finally allowed to hand his paper in, he all but stormed out of the great hall in his quest to find Harry. Hermione and Weasley were at his heels, and when they found no trace of their friend in the entrance hall, they took off towards the hospital wing. They met Harry halfway, dashing down the stairs to get to them. Draco caught Harry's arms when they came to a halt, needing to touch him in some way to calm himself. What happened? he demanded breathlessly. But Harry only shook his head and led them down the first floor corridor, searching until he found an empty classroom and then pushing them inside, closing the door behind them. 
He leaned against the door, still pale as parchment, and his eyes were wide and fear-struck. Voldemort's got serious, he announced in rushed words. Draco stared. What? Hermione called. Heard you! Weasley began. Saw it just now, when I fell asleep in the exam. But, but where? How? Hermione asked, her face now as bloodless as Harry's. I don't know how, Harry said impatiently, but I know exactly where. There's a room in the Department of Mysteries full of shelves covered in these little glass balls, and they're at the end of row 97. He's trying to use Sirius to get whatever it is he wants from in there. He's torturing him. Says he'll end by killing him. Harry was a mess. He was trembling all over, and his voice was shaking as he spoke, and all Draco wanted was to pull him into his arms and hold him. But he was quite literally frozen, so all he could do was watch as Harry moved over to a desk, sat down on it, and tried to rule in his emotions. How are we going to get there? He asked finally. At that, something in Draco unlocked. His brain signaled danger so severe that he took a step forward, shaking his head. Harry, no, he said. You can't go. What are you talking about? Harry called, immediately defensive. It's serious. We have to rescue him. First, we have to check if he's really there, Draco reasoned. Have you forgotten everything I told you about the dangers of that connection you and the Dark Lord share, Harry? He might be trying to lure you there. It might be a trick. It wasn't a trick with Mr. Weasley, Harry shouted. I know, Draco conceded a little desperately. But that's exactly why he might have realized it was an option. Harry, please, we need to stop and think this through. There is no time, Harry yelled. Sirius might be dying. And if he isn't, the Dark Lord will kill you. And then what? Draco yelled right back. Okay. Hermione interrupted them, stepping in between them and holding her hands up in a soothing gesture. Calm down, both of you. This is getting us nowhere. We need to think of what to do. I'm thinking of what to do, Harry called. I'm thinking of how to get to Sirius. Draco is the one who's stalling. Hermione exchanged a pained look with Draco before saying very carefully, Harry, Draco has a point. We have to check. This whole thing just seems so... so unlikely. Think about it. It's five o'clock in the afternoon. How would Voldemort and Sirius have got in without being seen? The Ministry of Magic must be full of workers. Exactly, Draco nodded, relieved beyond words that Hermione was backing him up. Orvers are guarding the whole building. How was he supposed to have gotten in undetected? He can't have that many Death Eaters in Ministry ranks, Harry, not in the current climate. I don't know. Harry shouted, glowering at them. I don't know, okay? He must be using an invisibility cloak or whatever. But I know what I saw, and he's there. You might have seen what he wanted you to see, Draco corrected. Or it might have been like when Ron's dad was attacked, Harry yelled. But why? Hermione called, sounding despaired. Why on earth would Voldemort want to use Sirius to get to the weapon or whatever this thing is? How would he have even gotten to Sirius if he has been locked up in the headquarters for months? Draco countered. None of it makes sense. I just thought of something, Weasley said in a hushed voice. Sirius's brother was a Death Eater, wasn't he? Maybe he told Sirius of how to get the weapon. Sure, Draco rolled his eyes. Because obviously the Dark Lord would have been on a desperate mission for the thing for the better part of the year if the information had been within his own ranks in the first place. Do you really think he'd have let his people spill to the other side, but not to him? It makes no sense, Hermione agrees. And we still have no proof that Voldemort and Sirius are even there. Hermione, I already seen them, Weasley snapped. We can't trust Harry's dreams, Draco yelled. Oh, so you don't trust me? Harry rounded on him. You know that's got nothing to do with it, Draco called, stung. The Dark Lord may be controlling what you see. How many times do I have to tell you? Well, all I know is that we are wasting time here, Harry called. Draco is right there, Harry, Hermione pleaded. Voldemort knows you. He took Draco down into the Chamber of Secrets to lure you there. It's the kind of thing he does. He knows you're the the kind of person who'd go to Sirius's aid. What if he's just trying to get you into the Department of Miss... Hermione, it doesn't matter if he's done it to get me there or not. I'd never have left Draco to die, and I'm not going to leave Sirius. That doesn't mean we shouldn't check to see if they are really there first, Draco insisted. And how do you propose we do that? Harry called. They've taken McGonagall to St. Mungo's. There isn't anyone from the Order left at Hogwarts who we can tell, and if we don't get to Sirius... At that moment, the door opened and Ginny and Luna entered the classroom. 
Jenny was looking back and forth between them in apparent curiosity, while Luna wore her usual vague expression, humming to herself as she closed the door after them. Hi, Jenny said hesitantly. We recognize Harry's voice. What are you yelling about? Don't you mind. Harry shrugged her off. Jenny raised her eyebrows at that, her eyes immediately flying to Draco's, as if he was Harry's official press rep of sorts. Can I explain why this one has reverted to being a complete bag of dung bombs? She inquired, pressing her lips. Harry groaned, turning away from them in frustration. You know, if you talked to us, maybe we can help? Jenny commented. Well, you can't. Harry snapped. Wait! Hermione interrupted, her voice urgent. Wait! Harry, they can help! That made Harry pause, and Hermione proceeded to explain that with Ginny and Luna's help, they could get into Umbridge's office, use her fireplace, and check if Sirius was at the headquarters. It was not a bad plan, all things considered, even if Harry was still vehemently arguing on points of there being no time. But still, Draco cut through the heated discussion, impatiently pointing out, You do realize that you're forgetting something, right? What? Hermione asked, looking honestly concerned. McGonagall might be at St. Mungo's, but that does still leave one member of the Order at Hogwarts. Jacob reminded them. When none of them reacted, he hissed, exasperated. Snape! Of course! Hermione breathed, her eyes as wide as saucers. Draco, you're brilliant! Harry and Weasley, though, were exchanging looks of much less enthusiasm, and Draco knew what they were thinking without them having to voice it. Yes! Draco rolled his eyes. I know Snape hates Sirius. I know you don't trust him. But if we tell him what you saw, he's bound to act. And what if he doesn't? Harry demanded. He's ignored me before, Draco. He might do it again. Draco groaned, running out through his hair and pulling out the strands, trying to think. Fine! He called. Fine! How about this? You go and break into Armage's office and make sure not to get caught while at it. In the meantime, I'll hunt down Snape and try to talk some sense into him. See if he will help us. It can't hurt to go down both roads, right? If worse comes to worse, we'll both come up with nothing and then we'll have Snape there to organize help. Harry looked like he had something to say about the idea of Snape being helpful, but he controlled himself and instead barked out, Fine, but only if we can think of a way to do all of this quickly, otherwise I'm going to the Ministry right now. And on that note, Draco said grimly, catching Hermione's eyes and nodding to her, I'll entrust you with a break-in mission while I go talk to my head of house. Thank you, Hermione breathed, sending him a quick smile before turning to Jenny and discussing the most effective strategies available. As Draco left the room, he caught mentions of peas and garroting gas and hoped dearly they had everything under control and would not blow up the skull in his absence.